Pete, your totally obsessed tennis coach. Now, if you enjoyed today's video with this TennisCon All-Star, make sure you stick around to the end because I'm gonna show you how can, you can get your hands on TennisCon 7, 100% free. So enjoy today's lesson and stick around the end of the video. Hey guys, I'm here with Nathan Pasha. We got a real treat for you today. This is five steps to a perfect backhand. And if you can't tell, Nathan is an absolute flat out baller. Played at Georgia, Bull Georgia Bulldog, right? Yeah, played at Georgia from 2011 through 2015. Wow, it's amazing. And what did you play on the roster there at Georgia? My first year I played five and six, and the next three years I played one, two, and three. One, two, and three. And now he's on the Pro Tour. You're, you're working your way on the Pro Tour, playing some singles and some doubles. Tell us how that's going. Primarily playing doubles, ranked around uh, 125 or so on tour, and uh, just loving the process. And the last couple of tournaments he's played, he's won. So Definitely. wish him luck by giving him a like to this video right now. All right, we're gonna get right into this with step number one. All right, guys, so step number one is the grip, okay? And I think there's some flexibility in your double-handed backhand grip. Lots of grips, you know, sometimes like the serve, I think it's a non-negotiable. You've got to know how to have a continental grip on your serve. But what do you think about your two-hander? What grips are you in? Let's talk about your bottom hand first, which would be your dominant hand. What, what grip are you in and like to use for that? I'm in the eastern grip here with, with the bottom hand, and I feel like that allows me to get an adequate amount of spin once I stick my left hand on the racket. So he's in an eastern backhand grip. I think you can also be in a continental grip too. So if you want to be in a, con how do you find that eastern? If, that's going to give you the ability to get a little more spin for free when you go into that eastern backhand grip, okay? A lot of people have a two-hander are in a continental grip. I think if you have a one-hander, you definitely have to be in the eastern backhand grip. So continental grip is basically shaking hands with the racket like this. A lot of people call it the chopper grip where you can basically come here, hammer a nail like that. Now if you want to get to what Nathan's doing here, you're just going to move the knuckle a little more on top. That gives you a little more spin for free. It's also going to put your wrist up automatically to get you, help you get in that power position. All right, so what about the top hand? What do you like to do with that? I'm in a semi-western grip with the top hand. You know, I feel like I get the same balance of uh, power and spin, and it's not overly spinny to where I feel like I'm going to be in danger of swinging too short, and it's not overly long where I feel like I don't get any spin at all. Yeah, and when you're playing with a lot of your buddies out there that are on tour, would you say that they're in a similar grip? Would you say this is more what the, the players are doing today to get set up so they can get a lot of spin, a lot of racket head speed and power? Of course. On, on tour, players are very balanced with their grips. They're, they're in the middle of, of not getting much spin with the continental grip or getting too much spin with the, with the extreme western grip. They're yeah. right in the middle. Yeah, and there is some flexibility there. So also on your grip, uh, you were talking about, hey, the more I do this, can you show people that? The more I do this, I'm going to get more spin. The more I do this, I'm going to get more maybe flat ball or more power. So right. how do you think about the grips as you're preparing and what you're going to get for free and, and just by setting up your hands? Well, I know in, in terms of setting up my, my right hand, the, the, more I, uh, the more I switch my racket towards more of a western grip where the, be where the bed of the racket is facing down, I'm going to get more spin for free. So that means I have to swing much longer with my left hand to carry the ball over the net. The right. other end of the spectrum is a continental grip with the right hand, which means when I put my left hand on the racket, I have to do more work, more hand work to get more spin on the ball. So the ball's gonna go straight, and then I have to add the spin with the left hand to get the ball up and down. That's right. So if you wanna go more, hit more of a flat backhand, you wanna be more in that continental grip, the more you go with your bottom hand over to the eastern backhand grip, which you'll see like a lot of professionals set up with a one-hander, but also with a two-hander, then you're gonna, easy to get the spin, and you can also flatten that ball out. Now, when you're playing your matches, because here's another thing about the grips, is it's not about getting the backhand grip, but it's about being able to switch back and forth from forehand to backhand. Now, are you staying more in a, a neutral position? Are you cheating to the forehand and then switching? How are you doing that? I hold a forehand grip at all times, and I have my backhand grip, uh, the semi-western backhand grip on top, and anytime I switch to hit a backhand, during my unit turn, I just turn my hand, and then now I have uh, the proper grip on my backhand with the bottom hand. And 
And I notice a lot of pros do that. If you look at a lot of players get in the right position to return a serve, that's where you can kind of tell where they're at. Like Rafael Nadal, Maria Sharapova, notice how they're here and their racket face is facing down. So you can tell that they want to hit that forehand. And so you're always looking to run around and hit a lot of forehands. Am I right on that? Of course. Of course. <laughs> but you're not afraid to hit that backhand either. So what, what happens there, if you notice what Nathan was doing, is he's in a semi-western, or are you in a semi-western or full western? Looks I'm like my semi-western. Okay. Semi-western. Looks like it might be an aggressive semi-western, almost tilting to the full western. And so what he does there is he is relaxing. He's got his grip set up on his top hand, and then you're relaxing that bottom hand to move over. Is that right? Exactly. The, 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 the bottom hand is completely relaxed because it needs to make that switch as soon as you make your unit turn. Yeah. And so what I suggest that you guys do, and we'll have Nathan do a couple right now to get that grip, because I think if you just watch the video and go, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do, it's not going to happen for you once you get in the heat of battle. And, and so many people get caught up having the wrong grip when they're trying to hit, and then the ball flies on them. So we're going to get Nathan in his ready position. And no, just like you're going to play a match. Uh, there you go. And so now he's in his forehand grip. And what he's going to do is just practice going back and forth f four to six times. This, I'm going to call out and I'm going to go backhand. He's going to get set. Ready? So one, two, three, backhand. And see, he's right there. See how quick he is? It's automatic. It's smooth. So we'll go back to the forehand. And we're going to go backhand. So you can do that again. Another thing I like people to do is, just so you can feel the senses there, Nathan, get in a ready position, close your eyes, and now go to the backhand. Boom. So it's just there. So you can do it literally in your sleep. And uh, I just want to ask Nathan a question. See how smooth that was? One thing that almost every instructor begs their students to do, but they don't have to beg the really good players to do, <laughs> is shadow swings. Nathan. How old were you when you started to walk around the house doing a drill just like that with no one telling you? When I was really young, seven, eight years old, but I have a big imagination. I'm, imagine, I'm imagining playing all the slams, so I'm imaginary. I'm imagining doing everything. And, and I bet you, you still go around the house from time to time setting up your shots. Am I right on that? Of course, of course. <laughs> yeah, there are times where I set a timer for two minutes and I just practice the motion of a stroke, especially on my serve, actually. Now, why would you do that? Because you've got a great serve. You've got a great forehand. You've got a great backhand. You've got this on autopilot. You know how to do it. Why would you still do this? Well, a, a lot of execution comes down to making the same movement under pressure. Um, regardless of the pressure of the situation, you can feel the same rhythm, have the same timing, and, and you just have to practice the same movement over and over again and envision yourself in that space to, to be calm in those moments. Awesome. That's some great stuff right there. Let's go to step number two. Okay, so after the grip, step number two on your way to having a perfect, professional looking style two hand backhand is the unit turn. And that's getting yourself set up really quickly in a power position. So Nathan, show us your unit turn and then I want to point out some things that, that I'm noticing here about the way you get set. Good. See that? Now he gets set there right away. Look at how the arms have a slight bend in them. So he's not too tense. Some people are too tense in their arms, too straight. And then some people really bend their arms. And this one you're going to be really army. So he's got, he looks like he's relaxed. Also notice how the racket tip is facing up. So tell me, why has your coach trained you to get in this exact position that you're in right now? Well, I want to be in a position to allow the racket to swing itself and create some natural momentum. So the whole point of keeping the tip up is to create kind of a pendulum effect when you swing. So I can just let gravity take over at the top of the swing and then I just let everything come down and I let my follow through completely go. That's awesome. Now on the one-handed toss and backhand, you'll notice players like Federer and, and uh, Dominic Thiem, they get set here and their racket actually faces back to the fence. Best shot of the match. Finished.
Now, on the forehand, what everybody's teaching is to come here and then come to the outside. With a two-hander, what are you doing? Does the racket ever drag behind the hips or it does? Okay. You, 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 want the, you want the racket to drag behind you on any top spin shot you hit because the racket drag gives you the spin. Okay. I like to think of pointing my butt cap at the ball because that creates a natural drag. And then when you come through the shot, your left hand naturally makes this, this door turning motion as if you're turning a door, and that's what gives you the spin. I just have to make sure I hit the bottom of this ball. Awesome. That is a great, great thing. Now, when you get here set up, are you focused on, notice I can see your back a little bit. And so, how are you gonna be using, with your unit turn, because we're gonna go into step number three, Okay, step number three and step number two are, you know, you need step number two to get to step number three. So we're going to transition right now into step number three for that perfect backhand. So you're set up in your unit turn, you got the racket head up. How is this going to help you uncoil into the ball right now and allow you to use your hips, which is step number three. Really having those hips shoot through the ball is going to create a tremendous amount of power. I think this is probably the most important detail. It's a detail a lot of people miss. On the unit turn, the majority of our weight has to be on the back leg. So by the time we're stepping into the shot to hit, we can propel all of the weight to the front leg, and that's what carries all of our momentum through to properly let our racket go and follow through. So on the unit turn, if I'm completely centered, my center of mass is in the middle of my body, I want to be leaning more on the left side, so about 90% of my weight's on my left leg, and then as soon as the ball comes, you lean into the shot, and then all of your weight is on your right leg, and then you continue to lean towards the target, and you let your follow through go. That's amazing. Just, just even without hitting a ball, it already looks very powerful, doesn't it? So that's pretty awesome stuff. Okay, so we've got the unit turn, and what are some things that you do with your coach to help you get prepared really quickly? In terms of preparation, I like to focus on tracking, which is just seeing the ball early. The earlier I see the ball, the earlier I naturally react. I don't want to get the racket back too quickly to where I lose rhythm with, with the ball that's coming, but I also don't want to take a chance and get the racket back too slowly and make it hard to time on the back end. What I want to do is really make sure I just focus on seeing the ball so I can make natural rhythmic movements according to what's coming to me, if that makes sense. So a lot of times people see the ball late when the ball is already almost past the net. I'm telling people to focus on seeing the ball as soon as it leaves the racket. Okay, so are you in that unit turn? Um, would you say most of the time before the ball is bouncing on your side or as the ball is bouncing on your side? When are you getting ready? I, I, I'm getting ready as soon as the ball leaves my opponent's racket. So for example, I split step, I see the ball is traveling to the backhand side, and then as soon as the ball starts to travel to me initially, that's when I'm slowly starting the unit turn and awesome. getting my weight on the back legs and then transfer through the shot. Awesome, great stuff. Okay, step number four is so important, and that's when you're coming to the contact. You know, you have to kind of maybe be thinking about this a little bit. In the beginning, you gotta think about it. I don't think Nathan has to think about it very much when he's playing. He's got that, you know, unconscious competence going right now for him, which is, which is great. But the role of the hands, and we want them to be relaxed, and we also want them to know their roles. So how do you keep your hands 
relax coming to the ball? Is there any tricks you have to keep those hands relaxed and not tightening up? I know a lot of people tighten up on their two-hander. Actually, when I stopped uh, playing and started to teach, I actually lost my two-hander because I always had four or five balls in my hand. I noticed when I'd play for myself on very rare occasions, I would tighten up a lot in my hands on contact because I started to lose the feeling. How are you staying relaxed and what hand do you think is in the most control throughout the shot or is it even? Well, the left hand's in the most control throughout the shot. The right hand is just on the racket for stability. That's number one. But in terms of staying relaxed, it really starts initially with the swing. We have to, we have to achieve the pendulum effect and let the racket swing itself if we want to stay relaxed. If we have no momentum going into the shot, our arms have no choice but to be tight. So in terms of being able to use our hands, it's starting here and it's practicing letting the racket fall. Practicing letting the racket fall. It's practicing a gravity draw because that sets the stage for your hands to, to be able to work because now it has some momentum behind it. So that's the first step. The next step is seeing the ball as a clock face and trying to hit the bottom of the ball. So after you've achieved some nice momentum to get some, to get some spin, now you're aiming to hit the bottom of the shot. And then that's all I really kind of think about. I think about having loose hands, having good momentum. Oh, and I almost forgot a step. Pointing, a butt, pointing the butt cap at the rack, uh, pointing the butt cap at the ball because that sets your hand in a position to where it's ready uh, to work because the, the whole, the way the hands work is ultimately when you start the butt cap and you set the wrist and as soon as I start to swing through, my hand naturally makes a turning motion as if I'm turning a doorknob and that's what gives you the spin. The biggest key from there is just hitting the bottom of the ball. A lot of people hit the back of the ball once they learn how to work their hands and the ball goes straight down into the net. We really have to hit the bottom of the ball. Okay, and so using that idea of pointing the butt cap to the tennis ball, is that kind of giving you the same idea that you get on the forehand, what people call a lag and a snap? Yes. Are, you, are you finding that you're getting that, building that acceleration just by making that move? Exactly, exactly. Like the pointing the butt cap at the ball sets the stage for that lag effect. All right, Nathan, first of all, give this video a, a thumbs up. This is like Nathan's first time doing a YouTube video and I think he's amazing at it and teaching a great lesson on the two-hander. So Nathan, last question here. Step number five is the follow-through. How do we get that combination of spin and drive through the court? What are you focusing on as you're coming through to the follow-through? Uh, I'm, I'm focusing on accelerating at this part in my swing and I'm focusing on having enough racket head speed to where my follow through just naturally rides out without me having to think about manufacturing any kind of follow through. And you were t we were talking about that off camera a little bit. You find Nathan is also teaching some lessons and you find that a lot of your students are manufacturing the follow through. What exactly do you mean by their manufacturing the follow through? What, is that, what does that mean in your mind? Right, right. Well, well in general, people see, people see the follow through of strokes and they see the finish in the up position without the racket going through its full course of motion. People want to pull the follow through up early and the issue with pulling it up like this is not only do you pull the ball further up for long misses, but you get this kind of thin spin without much weight on it. So if you want a good heavy shot, you have to swing out to get some weight on the ball and your hands work uh, for the spin to bring the ball back down. And the follow through is simply just your racket just losing momentum after that. But it starts with the hip swing and then the follow through, the follow through just naturally happens. So I would say the best way to train a follow through is honestly by missing long. Um, but wanting the ball to rotate forward. If you're missing long, but the ball is rotating forward, you're doing something right. And now it's about working the hands a little bit more from there to add just a little bit more spin to drop the ball down. But that's generally how I train a follow through. So Nathan, this can be a lot of fun. You have some ideas to warm up the hands, really get the feeling of the tennis ball brushing off the racket. So explain, set this one up for me. Right, so th this is a hand skill drill and all a hand skill really is, is being able to keep your natural swing and you're able to work your hand to get spin on the ball 
without deviating from your natural swing path. So I want people to start by establishing their natural swing path and then work on spinning the ball up and down over the net, up and down over the net to get it to dip down into the baseline is the goal when you're waking up your hand. Very cool. And so you would have a coach right here doing some hand feeds for you? Yeah, I, I would actually kind of have the coach stand here. Okay. So, so the ball can bounce forward. Okay, ready? Right like, just like that? Yep. Up and down. Good. Awesome. Looks beautiful. Awesome. And I imagine drills like this too, besides just working on the ground strokes back there, you get these short balls where the court gets smaller and you got to use a little more feel. This is going to come in handy, right? It's super handy. Anytime we have to add tighter spin to a shot, whether we're hitting an angle that requires tighter spin, whether someone hits a really hard flat ball and we have to take all that pace and absorb it and add a lot of spin so it dips back into the court, that requires a lot of hand work also. So a hand skill is needed for a lot of different shots in tennis, which is why a lot of really good players start by warming up their hand before they actually start hitting. And Nate, another thing you like to do for your hands is have the coach feed you some balls where you take it out of the air. Yeah, yeah. So swinging volleys, any ball dropping out of the air forces you to use your hand a ton and just get the ball up and down. Balls dropping out of the sky, you're swinging low to high is just uh, with, with some loose hands is a recipe for spin. So uh, generally what I think about is I want that ball going up when it leaves my racket, but I still want to be swinging out. I don't want to manufacture a follow through and get the ball up that way. I want to be swinging out and working my hands and have the ball still uh, go up as it leaves my racket. And the ball should actually still be rising as it crosses the net and have enough spin to dip back down into the court. So that's the goal for this one. Okay, Nathan, so this is your third drill that you like to use for your hands. Yep. Set me up on this one. So, so the great thing about this drill is when you start at the baseline, you have to hit more of a longer, heavier drive spin that goes through the court. And then as you get closer, you have to add tighter and tighter spin so the ball doesn't go out because you obviously get uh, closer uh, to the net inside the court and you have to add more spin to dip the ball down before it goes out. All right, let's do it. You ready? Yep. Here we go. Good. Try it one more time. Is that good feeds right there? Great. Great. You keep even a little lower. Even a little lower. Ready? Go. Good. Good. Perfect. Perfect. Great job. Nathan, that was really, really awesome stuff. I wish you the best of luck this year on tour. What, what is next for you? Where are you going next? Well, we're supposed to be going to Turkey uh, the second or third week of January for, for two weeks. And then after that, we'll go to South Africa before coming back home. The life of a tennis pro. Yeah, exactly. Hey, Turkish Nightmare, he's coming for you. We actually taught a guy named the Turkish, well, he, we, we named him the Turkish Nightmare because he's so awesome. Uh, so good luck in Turkey. Thank you so much. Hopefully you'll be back for some more videos. And if you like this video, if you want to see more videos like this, you want to subscribe right now because when you subscribe, YouTube's gonna notify you that we put another video out. Another thing too, when you subscribe to this channel, you get unlimited B2 puppy kisses. So we'll see you on the next video. Not a great lesson. Now I have 40 more amazing lessons like that with the best coaches on the planet. These are master classes you're not gonna find anywhere else on the internet. The event is called Tennis Con 7. You can get free 48 hour access to the event right now. I usually only open this up once a year in October, but since you're watching this video, you can get your hands on it right now by clicking in the card section or the description box below. So I've got a preview for you actually. If you don't know what Tennis Con is, it'll give you a better idea and it all looks awesome to you. Make sure you sign up for free.